My name is Dr. Simon Mullen, and as the interim provost and vice president of academic affairs, it gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you to the COVID CEO lecture series. I would like to welcome members of the St. John's University Board of Trustees, members of the Toby College of Business Advisory Board, students, This afternoon, we have the distinct pleasure and privilege of welcoming Mr. Kenneth Langone to St. John's. One of the most passionate, hardworking, and entrepreneurial business leaders in the US. <coughs> Mr. Langone is the co-founder of Home Depot, a chairman and chief executive officer at Paperman Associates. Mr. Langone also serves as vice chairman of the board of overseers of the New York University Student School of Business, the Board of Trustees of New York University, and is the Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the New York University Langone Medical Center. Mr. Langone also believes in serving his community, and he serves on the boards of St. Patrick's Cathedral, Ronald McDonald, Paris in New York, and a charter school, the Thomas Academy. His recent book, I Love Capitalism and American Story, a heartfelt description of his challenges and successes in his career and life. Our moderator this afternoon is Dr. Noreen Sharp, Dean and Joseph H. and Mary Maria C. Swartz, Distinguished Chair at the Peter J. Tobin College of Business at St. John's University. Mr. Langone, welcome to St. John's University. Thank you. Whatever happened to me, 
whatever, I don't know what a word was. I can tell you, I was a, I guess, at least a mischievous child. Quite active and stuff. I wish I had a nickel every time they came and say to me, if I never see you again, it'll be too soon. And, and then 10 minutes later, he's hugging me and kissing me and things that I can still pinch you with, which is a sign of affection. I felt like I had a gift in childhood then. And I look back and it dawns on me that, you know, it wasn't easy. And, and the wonderful thing about both, both my parents is they were pretty luck. My mother's favorite expression was, everything happens for the best. And that's a good start. I mean, like, I can't imagine getting up in the morning, even now, and not looking forward to something good. And if you don't, for something good, and stay in bed, forget the day, right and off. So I, I came out of this family that had enormous love, tight-knit family, aunts, uncles, cousins, I mentioned in the book, one of my favorite television shows is a show on Friday night called Blue Bloods. And the thing that appealed to me in that television show are the Sunday lunches, because that was exactly, not in, not in as nice circumstances, but, you know, it was a big table, and pasta, and all the good balls, and you name it, and, and the gaiety, and laughing, and happiness, and, my aunts, uncles, and cousins, there was always room at the table for them. Always. So that was the charm that I had. Uh, to me, it was a home of good beginning. But I think, frankly, much of what I've been able to do in my life is that because I came from that shop. And I think it shows the importance of support. Absolutely. As a supportive family. Absolutely. Material belongings. I was blessed that I met this wonderful lady when she was 16 and I was 18, and she followed through like my parents. Source of support and encouragement. So I, I lucked out. I went from a loving family to a loving life. To celebrate our 62nd wedding anniversary. That's a long time. You then write in, in the book about your experience of Vietnam. You won't hold that against you, by the way. And you won't talk about. I think St. John's would be the top man in basketball, so, so we'll leave that alone. Uh, I know you're fond of this little more large in the book, particularly this thing. Would you share with us your thoughts? When I was in college, history was not a favorite subject. It is now. I, I can't read enough. This, I wish I realized how rich history could be and was. Uh, but I'm glad I quite caught on to what he mentioned. I started editing between 1914.
came in the morning, I got up, well, I wasn't excited about going to work, even when I was in the army. I was a test, but it was boring. Uh, I was in the army twice. But, but uh, love what you're doing, and the fact of studying, taking advantage of being here, taking advantage of taking a course that you might never, ever again get a chance to And I'm not knocking business school, I'm a devotee of the fact that the part time program at NYU, which was the only program they had when I went, my wife and I endowed, and it's now called the Langone Program. So I, I'm, I'm certainly a, a supporter, but, but don't just learn all about business. You know, get, get, get some history, get some philosophy, get some religion. I'm not sure if you know the religion of St. John's, but you don't get it. Get some. Uh,
and I started uh, out of 50 bucks a week and to be a secretary, and that's how I told him. I had already got my MBA, I was, I got, was in the army, they built a wall around Berlin, and when they built a wall around Berlin, and they needed 100,000 hardy soldiers, and I was one of them, they called, I don't know what they were going to do with it, they took me in the army the second time. And uh, when I got out, I went around Wall Street. I brought me 40 different firms. I was almost first gone. Long on. And there was a man at New York Hansi Attic. It was a, bar, a foreign, foreign bonds trading firm. They traded foreign bonds, corporations, governments. And he was part of my father was. A man named Maurice Hart. And Mr. Hart, Set me down and he said, How you doing? I said, I'm not doing very well. I've been all over Wall Street. Now, mind you, it was tough. That was good. In May of 62, we had the biggest crash in the stock market since 1929. May. So it was a big exodus. Never go to Wall Street. They're running out, you know, like last week was in the gym. And he said, What do you do to lay the land from here? He said, We have Jewish firms and Jewish. And we have lots of firms and lots of years. The Irish can be put on the floor of the exchange as clerks, and the Italian can be put in the back office as clerks. He said, you're better than me. And by the way, that was an important moment for me, because this is one of those people in your life that sees more of you than you see in yourself sometimes. I'm more than one person see more in me than I thought I had myself. So anyway, you go out and find yourself a job at the bank or the insurance company. Do the best, learn as much as you can. And that's exactly what happened. And finally, I lost it on the press release. And the new, it was 62, that August of 62, July of 62, I had an interview with a guy who was in the room and said, you know, he said, I'd love to hire you. We have a higher than free stuff right now. I don't want to tell you something to say. Success. I don't know. I gave a jump. I gave a good success. <laughs> Help me out. Can I talk to you? And he said, you got, you're, you got the greatest aspect of the brain stuff. I said, it's like you're sensitive. You should learn what they want to kill or what they want to do. That's a good one. I said, okay, he's been on. He said, well, he's like, we, we can't hire him. We're, we're down the world. But I left his office and I went down 80 miles street. I went down the elevator and I went, well, go down the elevator and say, wait, this guy thinks I'm so good at living in mind. So I turn around and go right back up in the elevator. Yes, this is going into the kill. Uh, and I said, there was a white suit in the car. It was Jack Cullen. I said, white suit in the car again. He comes out, did you forget something? I said, no, Mr. Collin. I said, what are you pay secretary? He said, you pay him 150 bucks a week. Now I have an MBA, I have five years of experience. I also, by the way, had an 18-month-old son, and my wife was giving birth to my second son two months later. And he said, you pay him 150 bucks a week. I said, well, how about paying me 150 bucks a week? You, know, you can't make it, I said, I'll make it. I'll make it. So I hired him for a hundred years. I said, by the way, I said, he's only in tradition. You have to give me every account. I'm doing business. There's no doubt so. And I'm doing business for him. I have a right to call him. Cincinnati, Columbus, Toledo, Dayton, Indianapolis, Louisville, you name it. Wherever there was an institution, a bank, an insurance company, or a trust department, or a pension fund, and I worked for him at first. He wouldn't fly. He didn't like flying. So we go by train. Wouldn't uh, easy. And over a period of three years, I had to start to Things started to happen big time. And I went to the old man, senior guy, calling the boss. I said to him, Look, I said, I've got all this courage right now. I got accounts at Cleveland and Toledo. This is, by the way, right at the time when institutions moved aggressively into the stock market. Before that, for example, the state pension funds only had bonds and 
And now they're starting to learn about equities. So things are starting to happen. When I went to work, he said, we're not going to go on your way. And I said, well, look, I'm going to need help. And this is what we talk about. The Eddie Brown is a part game. Uh, and I said, oh, I don't know what I'm going to ask it. They all work under my number. But the business they bring in is on my number. And he wouldn't even do that. So to pay their insurance or whatever it was they need. And again, we do that for nothing. The Eastern Bar's father was a cop. Tommy Gates' father was a trader on Wall Street. Traders today are in a position, but back then they were more fighting courts. That's what they were. So we hired all these kids. Joe Common, uh, uh, they were all Irish. We had a lot of Irish at St. John's. I, mean, I, I can't think of how many Irishmen that came out of St. John's. Are there a lot of Irishmen here or what? I don't know. I mean, it looks like a pretty diverse No, but so we hired these kids, and they came to work for me, and we hit the wall with the fence. So, can you mention for all the fence? I'm going to go to the baseball yeah. number. Yeah, I know. Is that what you want? I said, no. You look out there, 
his case of I big man in my life. He said, so what am I going to do with you? I'm going to get away with other And I'm going to see what happens most of the time. He said, I want to thank for you. You have promised for you. I'm going to work my job. We'll do your part. Because that's the deal. He said, God, the downside was I didn't do it.
The gal that runs the 1700 American stores, because we have Canadian, we have Mexico, and we have one, we have Puerto Rico, the gal that runs the 1700 American stores, Anna Marie Kennedy. She's an African American. She started with us as a commissioner three or three years ago. She's got 340,000 people working for her. Did I say any more about the importance? She's phenomenal. She's not good. She's spectacular. She's incredible. That's a success. success. Yeah, and, but understand the culture. I called her. I got a, by the way, I still in this day, did it today. I got a, well, a new spirit of love from a man in Arizona about a bad experience she had in her store. And I was going to write it back and I said, how do I typically answer every piece of mail I get? No, And it was going to take too much writing to respond to the letter, so I picked up the phone and I called him. 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 Well, it's not really that big, you know, you've got to do it. Before I even started about him, I had to put his hands up, okay? And I'll call out a great. I was on the other Blue show about two weeks ago, and a woman in Oregon emailed me that she went into a store to buy a stove. And she ordered it. And it's now three months, and she still hasn't got the stove. I want to order attention. And she keeps me. It's out of stock. That's what's on the So I called Anna Marie. Top Gaff, Top Lady, Top Top Thomas. Within two days, what happened was, was it out of stock? They stopped making that model. The person who worked in the store didn't do his or her job by going in and saying, why are we out of stock? That's the extra mile. And the woman called me back. She had a picture. She, thank God for the technology that they can take pictures of each other instead of going down to the drugstore and getting them to follow up the mail. You don't remember this stuff. It was an easy thing. I remember. And, and this woman was blown away. She couldn't believe it. Every single customer matters. Every single customer matters. And every, this is a culture. The culture has got to be. But it's one for all. Don't tell people they matter. Don't tell people you care about them and then be indifferent. I, I'm retired. I'm not retired from the work. Bernie and I put a rule in that 73 of the board. Bernie left the board five years before me, and I left the board 10 years ago when I was 73. But Bernie and I still go to the stores, and we still get to the rule. And I like to do something every year. Uh, I did a little restaurant out in Suffolk County and I did a little for lunch. I did this July. It was about 30 of them in a circle. It was a big table in this nice little restaurant. And I said, okay, tell me a little bit about yourself. I'm sitting there. Tell me about, you know, how long you with us. Tell me about what we're doing right, tell me about what we're doing wrong. You know, tell me what Home Depot means to you. So the whole went around, and the last person's here. You know, like, we did a lot. She tell me the following story. She got pregnant, she was 17, and had a child, and was a married. She got pregnant again at 19, the same again. And now again. She ends up on welfare. Her mother said to her, I'm going to take care of the kids. You go out and get a job. She came to work. That's the issue. And she now tells me, she gets over 19 years. The one daughter graduated from college, she paid her tuition. The second daughter is about to finish, she paid, she paid her parents' mortgage. Uh, she paid her mortgage off. She's telling me all about 
hundred billion dollars in sales. So think about how many transactions. Each transaction is a customer. We can't control those customers. But four hundred thousand, and that's the number they ought to have. But the, the guy that called me, that what I called up in Arizona today, that was complaining. So another of my data stories is you know, when the first started a company development, didn't have much in the you could share with us your strategy for creating a perception of new employees. One of the things you have to do is you aspire to be a business person. You gotta understand that money is important for creativity and imagination will carry you a lot further. We had about a million dollars available for inventory in our first stores in Atlanta, Georgia. That's where we opened up off of. That's where we had to work. The vendors gave us as much credit as they could to get the million dollars we had. We ended up having enough purchasing power to buy merchandise customer level. We had these, we got a whole week where you see these racks all the way up to the top. All the way up to the top. What now would it look like if you walk into this big box and you saw nothing in it? You're going out of business, right? Image. Pat Barrett. <coughs> Genius. Genius. Pat Barrett. We, we squeezed the vendors and squeezed them as much as we could. We still had the empty space. But Pat said, okay. Give us a few boxes with the labels on them. Now, when you came into those first two stores, you said, oh my God, look at the merchandise. Oh, this thing is, this has got to be great deals. Look at all the products they got. This is fabulous. <laughs> but it did the trick. It sent the message. So you got to make up what you don't have. In one way, you have to make up in another way. And if you want, really, if you don't have the ability to bounce back, if you don't have the ability to say, oh, wait a minute, i got to figure this thing out. If you haven't got that, forget it. It's over. Somebody's going to eat your lunch. And that's, that was the story. Well, that's the wow. The book is full of stories like that. So they would be recommending I'm going to share a few more things that we haven't talked about. My evening daughter, who is a graduate of the department, even more than this year. Oh, she? My son is here somewhere in the audience, in the part time meeting, and gave her over here at St. John's. Equally smart, equally smart children. And we both know George Hayward. And the Jewish. The Jewish Hayward is one of the great people in life. He had a lot of very close friends. So you mentioned that George, your Dean Daly, is turned at the time. Asked if you support Stern's part time program. Right. And so you paid your first $10 million in my to invest in the program that became the Langone and the Working Professionals. Clearly, giving back to the community is important to you. But could you share with sure. us their thoughts on that? By the way, I, I am adamant in my business where anybody else does with their money. My mother and father had very little. And, and there's a knock I have on my faith, the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church used to have a horrible time. <coughs> had a horrible time. The two big collections were Christmas and Easter. When I was in another way, the words were my faith and my spirituality is probably the most important thing in my life. Okay, so take it from there. The Catholic Church used to put a publication out a couple of weeks after Easter and after Christmas. Well, who gave what? Who gave $100? Who gave $50? Who gave $25? I hate it. I used to hate when that was came out. I did. 
Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I guarantee you, my Father, you will put out something. Put that walk in. I just read, I have a new Bible study guy that I read yesterday morning. I read the parable. And I'm a woman that had two pennies. Other people who put big money in the box of it. And so did I. And this woman put in two pennies. I'm 
understanding that he can't do it here, he can't do it anywhere. And there you have a problem. Look in the mirror and ask yourself the question, what can I do to fix it? Am I the problem? Is there something about me that I should do different? I've had to ask all those questions and too many times, frankly. I've had to answer yes, guilty. And, and self adjustment is important in what you do. Know. But God damn it, stop complaining and stop, stop it. <coughs> Why do I write the book? I'm watching this, this nut. Probably most of you people like it, but I'm watching this nut, Bernie Sanders, <laughs> spewing this crap. And I didn't mind him because I figured he'd write him off. But there's a bunch of kids around him, and I'm saying, my God, what's going on? We're the greatest country on earth, and if you can't do it here, write it off. So that's why I wrote 